truth in that song. Jesus Christ wants to fix broken people. I'm glad he does because then I qualify, and if we're honest, you qualify as well. I was thinking during that song and the message this morning, the message is about failure. Your failure doesn't have to be final. Remember back to a time when I was, uh, oh, probably maybe nine or ten years old. I doubt my parents even remember this, but um, we were playing football in the dining room. I don't know why you're laughing. That was a great game. I am one of seven kids, and uh, I am sure, I don't remember exactly, but I'm sure my older sister was telling us to stop this, no doubt about that, and uh, I'm sure, like the brothers that we were, we ignored her like we normally did, and uh, I do remember a few key parts about this football game, one that I threw a perfect pass to my brother. I am not a football player, I'm not a quarterback, but this pass, and in my mind's eye, it was a spiral of all spirals. Choose your poison, Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, or somebody much, much older, Joe Montana. Whatever it was, at that moment, that throw was far superior to every one of those quarterbacks. And my brother missed the perfect throw. But what didn't miss a perfect throw was uh, the the, uh, um, light fixture that was an heirloom from my grand teller, my dad's, my dad's great-grandmother, and uh, that caught that football perfectly and uh, proceeded to explode. And <laughs> I thought about that because it's broken. The lampshade like that or the lamp with the, with the ornate pieces, things like that, it can, can barely be put back together and shattered. Sometimes in life we feel the same way that that we have been in a place and our life has been shattered in such a way that there's no way to put these pieces back together again. My friends, I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ wants to put the pieces back together again. And it's not about you and me trying to somehow assemble them in a way and, and try to craft them. Well, here, Jesus Christ, here's the pieces back together, do something with it. It's merely bringing the pieces to him and letting him do something great with them. He can do something far better than you and I can ever do in our life. I want you to turn your Bibles, if you have them this morning, with me to Mark chapter number 14. Last week we began this little mini-series on the Gospel of Mark. If you were here last Sunday, you remember that as I talked about the book of Mark, Mark is a gospel that is different than the other gospels. It will be similar in some of the accounts. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, are three that have similar accounts. But Mark, Mark is like a machine gun. If you missed it last week, go back and watch that, watch that part. You'll, you'll hear just in chapter 1 how Mark, like a machine gun, will begin just to bring about his point, which is Jesus Christ is a supreme servant. And he came to serve, and we ought to serve as well, serve him and serve others. But Mark, one thing after another in the book of Mark, barely a moment of rest in the book of Mark. Barely time to catch your breath. If you're reading the book of Mark, it is one account after one account after one account. And Mark, though the shortest of the three Gospels, has so much truth packed inside of it. But you may remember if you were last week, and if not, it's all right. I'll tell you this morning that Mark was not one of the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. Now, Matthew was, we know in Matthew chapter 9, when Matthew was called, he was a tax collector, uh, and he sat there, and Jesus Christ called him, and he pushed aside, I believe, pushed aside the table and pushed aside the money that he had stolen from people and followed Jesus Christ. Of course, the book of John was also one of the 12 disciples, but Mark was not one of the 12 disciples. Though I think we find his appearance here in the book of Mark and we know some things about him. But this morning, with the Lord's help, I want to look at this thought about failure. Because the fact is, all of us, all of us fail. Sometimes we deem it to be a small failure, a quiz in a class. It may sting a little bit. There may be some embarrassment, And sometimes it's a bigger failure. Boy, you've made a mistake driving. You got in an accident that was your fault. Sometimes it's a huge failure. Something that affects those closest to you and perhaps severs relationships and hurts people. But your failure and my failure doesn't have to be the end of our story. And in Mark chapter 14, we're going to read about some family. Look, please, in your Bibles, Mark chapter 14 beginning in verse number 33. Now at this point in the story, in the account of the gospel, Jesus Christ has ministered, 
for three years or right around that time frame. They've had the Last Supper and now they're in the garden and in this we're going to see that Jesus Christ is going to be betrayed. The crucifixion has not happened yet, but it's right before the crucifixion. So we're right at the end of the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. That's where we pick up in the garden after the Last Supper, beginning in verse 33 of Mark chapter 14. And he that is Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and it began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. Jesus Christ at this point is, there's some heavy things, some deepness weighing on him. He knows what's about to take place with the cross and the the coming turmoil, the battle between heaven and hell. He knows that there will be victory there, but he knows the cost that will be paid for this victory. And his soul, his spirit, his mind is heavy. He's burdened. Verse 34, and he saith unto them, that is Peter, James, and John, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. He says, wait here and and pray with me. And he went for it a little and fell on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. I'm going to pause there real quick. When Jesus Christ prayed to this prayer, it was a sincere prayer. Many have have speculated what this prayer all entailed. What I believe is this, that Jesus Christ was not as much concerned about the physical suffering, but the spiritual separation from his Father. During the time of the crucifixion, Jesus Christ will say this phrase, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why I believe that was the prayer is the fact that Jesus Christ in his ministry knew what was going to happen, that he was going to die and he was going to rise again the third day. But in the crucifixion, it was the one moment in human history that God the Father and God the the Son were separated. Not because of some wrongdoing on the part of the Son, but because, because the part of the wrongdoing of you and I, the sin of the world, caused separation from God the Father and God the Son. And Jesus Christ is, I believe, praying, If it's possible, there's another way. I'd rather that way. But then he says this in the greatest display of submission. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. This is not the sermon this morning, but just maybe a help to you, just a thought for you. There are times in life that you and I will face something that that will not be what we choose to face. And we'll probably even echo some of these thoughts, if not even this prayer. Lord, if it's possible, let there be a different path. Let this cup pass from me. I I wish there was some other way to accomplish this particular thing that needs to be done. And we must echo, at that time, the words of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, no matter what, not what I want, but what you want. What he says is, God, your way is the best way. Your situation is the best situation, though what I feel doesn't feel right. What I, what I really may want doesn't jive. What I most want is your will in my life. And Jesus displays that for us here. He prays this. You can feel just the burden in Christ's heart and his life. You can feel that burden. The Bible says that, verse 37, he cometh, and he findeth them sleeping. He comes back to the disciples, to Peter, James, and John, and they are not praying for Jesus Christ. Though Jesus Christ said, will you pray with me? Or will you sit here and pray? And he comes back, and, and, he, and he finds out that they have fallen asleep while they're praying. Good intentions, but a bad result. Now, don't raise your hand, but have you ever fallen asleep while you're praying? I will raise my hand. I remember a pastor once said, or a preacher once said, you've never really prayed till you've fallen asleep while you prayed. I don't know if that's true or not. All right, I think it probably made him feel good. Uh, but I've fallen asleep. I mean, I've been praying, and the next thing you know, you wake up, you're like, wow, that was some good time with the Lord. No, that was a good time relaxing. Peter, James, and John, they fell asleep this night. 
Jesus Christ comes back and the Bible says he finds them asleep and saith unto him, he wakes them up. He wakes up Peter. He says, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Peter, really? Could you not pray for me for one hour? For 60 minutes? Could you, I mean, on the greatest, on the eve of the greatest event in human history, could you not pray for 60 minutes? Again, verse 38, watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. He says, Peter, listen, you pray. In this instance, Peter, don't pray for my sake. Pray for your sake. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again, verse 39, he went away and he prayed. And he spake the same words that we found in verse 36. Verse 40, when he returned, he found them asleep. What's the next word? Again. Not only had they fallen asleep once in prayer, they'd fallen asleep twice in prayer. For their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. What that means is they didn't know what to answer him. They had no good excuse. Verse 41, the Bible says, And he cometh the third time. You see, Jesus Christ went back and prayed a third time. He comes back the third time, and the Bible implies here they fell asleep not once, not twice, or three times. This time he says, sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Then he says, rise up, let us go. He that is betrayeth me is at hand. So he wakes him up and says, listen, time to get up. The one who's betrayed me is here. Continue in verse 43. And immediately, while he yet spake, Judas, come with Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goes straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and they took him. They took Jesus. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me. I was daily with you in the temple, teaching, and he took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. These 20 verses we looked at are filled with failure. But my friends, failure doesn't have to be final. When we look at the Bible this morning, we're going to see how God can still work. God can still use someone even after they've messed up. Lord, I thank you for the time that we have. I pray the next few moments, Lord, you help our hearts to be encouraged. Lord, I pray that that you would challenge us. And Lord, if there's someone here this morning who perhaps feels like they've gone too far, they've done too much, hopeless and helpless, Lord, that you would bring hope and help to them today. Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know you as Savior, who's never trusted and believed in Jesus, Lord, I pray that today that they would Believe in Jesus and ask him for forgiveness of sins. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name and thank him for his help today. Amen. You see, failure doesn't have to be final, but sometimes, because of our choices, failure ends up being final. There are whole video places dedicated to showing people failing. Where they walk, the way they drive, and unfortunately, many of us have enjoyed people making a mistake. 
In fact, if I were to walk up and down these stairs and I were to trip, there would be a large number of you that if I tripped down the steps and failed up the steps would laugh at me. Now, there's a few kind-hearted spiritual people in this room who would gasp, oh, pastor, are you okay? But the rest of you pagans would say, hey, did the cameras catch that? This will be good. And there is some humor in that. If I fail as I walk, whatever, who cares? We can laugh about that. All of us have probably tripped in life walking down the sidewalk or just merely walking down a flat surface. Hopefully not injured too badly. We fail. I read about in history some of the larger failures of, of, of nations and countries. I read about that in 1453, during the siege of Constantinople, that the Byzantians, the nation, were under attack. And they were, they were entrenched and they were guarded, but, but the Turks were coming to, to overthrow the Byzantians. The problem is that night, one night, one soldier left the gate unlocked. You can read about it. And uh, the invading Turks poured in and overthrew the empire because the door was left open. What a failure. What a failure if that was your job. One job. Lock the front door. Oh, man, I was, I was busy. I was distracted. I didn't get to it. I read about in 1964, there was a graduate student. And you think a graduate student, boy, they're accomplished, they're intelligent. But this particular graduate student unwittingly cut down the oldest known tree in the world. This bristlecone pine tree uh, dated back 5,000 years. Apparently, a, a tool got stuck in the tree, and apparently he got irritated or frustrated and took an axe and chopped it down and only realized it was that old as he began to count the rings of the tree. Whoops. You can't just stack it back up with a little bit of super glue. Maybe no one will notice the tree is now dead. But failure doesn't stop there. In 1990, NASA, a government agency, spent $1.5 billion, with a B as in boy, billion dollars to launch the Hubble Space Telescope. And Mrs. Dalton, you probably know what happened. They launched the Hubble Space Telescope, and when it got to space and sent back its first pictures, they were blurry. No, it's true. They were, they were blurry. They messed up on the design and took three years to send up a space mission to fix the Hubble telescope because they put the mirror in wrong. They hadn't designed it correctly. One point five billion. One job. One job. <laughs> What's that a picture of? I don't know. It looks like static. Nineteen twelve little ship called the Titanic. little ship called the Titanic. The ship, they said, was unsinkable. You know, they didn't have any binoculars out that night. Maybe you knew this. Apparently, they had binoculars on board the Titanic, but they were locked up. They were locked up, and in fact, uh, a man, a sailor named David Blair, at the last minute was reassigned to another boat. Only problem was he kept the key to the cabinet that had the binoculars in his pocket. So that night, the man who was watching out for the icebergs for the Titanic could only use his eyesight. Of course, we know that devastation and the failing there was awful. See, there's lots of different type of failing in life. Sometimes it seems kind of small. Sometimes it seems, bi it seems big, but there's failing all around us. This morning, I want to give us just a few thoughts about failing with the thought that failing doesn't have to be final. In Mark chapter 14, we see some accounts of this, and I want you to remember this, first of all. Number one, if you're taking notes, this will help you, I promise you. Number one, sometimes you fail. You with me so far? Sometimes you fail. As hard as you and I try, 
As much effort as we attempt, whether it be in school, whether it be in sports, whether it be merely driving or walking down a flat surface, there are some times that you and I are going to fail. I'm not excusing it. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm just saying this is reality of life. That sometimes we, sometimes we fail. Now, this morning at 10 o'clock, we heard just some powerful testimonies. Some people were honest about some failings in their life. The fact is, if we were all honest, we could stay up here the rest of the day and tomorrow and share failings of life with everybody. And we could make the list long, and it would be egregious. But the fact is, sometimes we fail. In Mark chapter 14, we read, first of all, about Peter, James, and John, and their failing was failing to pray for Jesus Christ. Boy, I imagine if they could go back in time, if they could have gone back and then been able to pray for Jesus, I know without a shadow of a doubt that if they could have gone back, they would have stayed up to pray for him. What do they say? Hindsight is usually 2020. How many times have you been in life, you made a decision and something didn't go right, you failed, and you think, my goodness, if I could do that over again, I would have fill in the blank. I never would have gone there. I never would have made that phone call. I never would have said that. I never would have done that. See, sometimes, help me, sometimes we, we fail. Sometimes we fail. I'm not excusing it. I'm just helping us realize this morning it's a reality of life. It may seem small. It may seem big. But we fail. You fail. I fail. And we fail. Sometimes a test comes back with a big F at the top. Sometimes a project we spend hours on is a dud. Sometimes a product is a flop. Sometimes the reaction in anger is awful. Sometimes the response is terrible. Sometimes the struggle is real. But sometimes we fail. And I'm glad the Bible kept the account of the disciples failing in there. Because they're real men. They were real men, real women in the Bible. And we read throughout the Bible, cover to cover, that sometimes we fail. Jesus asks us to do something and we don't. We know what's right. We know the right choice and we don't. I forgot. I fell asleep. doesn't matter what the reason is, but the reality is sometimes we fail. But my friends, sometimes, not only do we fail, but sometimes you fail big. Sometimes it's not just a test, is it? You fail big and you think, boy, what I would just give for a failing test grade. What I would just give for a car accident. Sometimes you fail big. In fact, if you look in your Bibles, verse number 50 of Mark chapter 14, just a few words, we find some big failing. And they all forsook him and fled. If you know your Bible, you remember that before this happened, Jesus Christ told them, listen, you're all going to forsake me. Peter will argue with Jesus Christ. And Peter will say, ho, 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 time out, Jesus Time out. I know you think everyone's going to fail you and forsake you, but I'm not going to. Not me. Uh, everyone else may deny you, but, but I won't deny you. I won't forsake you. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, before this night's over, before this time's done, before the cock crows, before the rooster crows three times, you will deny me. Can you imagine the shame he felt. Sometimes we feel big. Where it's not a small issue, it's a big issue. I read a story about a pastor. The story goes, the onlookers thought it was unusual when the pastor pulled onto the property with a pickup truck. They thought it was more unusual as he drove the pickup truck across the grass and backed it right up to his office door. I thought it was unusual, Brother Treadway, as he refused all the help from those who came to offer as he began to unload his office in the back of the pickup truck. And he threw his books and his notes 
his computer, the pictures off his wall, load everything in the back of the pickup truck. They said he, his files, tossed him in a heap in the back of his truck. They said when he left the church that day, he drove down to the city dump, backed up the pickup truck to the city dump, unloaded every book that was in his office, every picture that was on his wall, every file that he had, every sermon that he wrote, and threw it in the back of the garbage of the dump. They said this young, gifted pastor was determined never to return to the pulpit. Sometimes we fail. Sometimes we fail big. You know, when we fail, part of the problem is that failure brings shame and embarrassment. It brings shame and embarrassment. In fact, look in the scripture, at verse 50, it says they all forsook him and fled. And look in verse 51, and there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Twice, once in verse 51 and once in verse 52, the Bible describes as this person was, was unclothed. Now, most scholars believe that this particular follower of Jesus right here was the writer of Mark. It was Mark himself, who was there that night, though not one of the 12 apostles, not one of the 12 disciples, he was there that night. He was there when Jesus Christ was betrayed. He was there when they came with swords and staves and, and sticks to take Jesus. He was there. And everyone fled, including Mark. Including Mark. He fled. He even risked his own embarrassment and his nakedness to flee, to not stand with Jesus Christ. You see, failure often brings shame and embarrassment. What struck me about this account in the scripture is the fact that these disciples and followers had seen Jesus Christ work over and over and over again. They had seen the multitudes fed. They had seen Jesus Christ walk on the water. They had seen demons cast out of individuals. And now these individuals who before could not be controlled, could now be controlled. They were sitting there. They were clothed in their right mind. They had seen issues of blood. They had seen diseases and, and that had been solved and healed. They had seen people that were dead and they were raised from the dead. They had seen all these things. And yet at this moment... Not only did they fail, they failed big. Hey, well, Pastor, what chance do I have? Well, let me give you one more. Not only do we fail sometimes, and not only do we fail big sometimes, but number three this morning, sometimes you keep on failing. Sometimes you keep on failing. You don't have to turn there, but in Acts chapter 15, we have another account of this man named Mark. The man who fled and turned his back on Jesus. In Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas, they're in Antioch and they're preaching the word of God. And, and some days the Bible says, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren into, into every city where we've preached the word and see how they do. And Barnabas to turn to take with them John, whose surname was Mark, but Paul thought not good to take him with them who departed from them and went not with them to the work. What happened was that Mark, this same Mark, when he was working with Paul a number of years later, he quit. And Paul said, I don't want Mark with me because Mark is a quitter. See, sometimes we fail. Sometimes we fail big. And sometimes we feel like we keep on failing. You ever been there before? You don't have to raise your hand, but I imagine you've been there before. You're like, man, I just can't find any victory. I just can't find any help. Sometimes it's family trouble, struggle with sin, question life, the problems of life, issues with leadership. It's too hot, it's too cold. We don't know why Mark quit. Perhaps the persecution was too great. We just know Sometimes we keep on failing. And my friends, if I stopped right there, if I stopped right there, it'd be a pretty grim sermon. You'd walk out of here like, wow, thanks, Pastor. Sometimes I fail, sometimes I fail big, and sometimes I keep on failing. Well, praise the Lord, I'm going to go live Monday now. <laughs> 
But I'm so glad that failure doesn't have to be final, aren't you? Oh, let me try that again. I'm so glad that failure doesn't have to be final. That's not the end of the story. In fact, my Bible says this, that a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. You even heard this morning how, how he said, listen, this guy has, has come and come. That's great. That's great. Because that's the story of my life and your life where we fail, but God brings grace. We fail again, we fail big, and God brings more grace. And we keep on failing, and God keeps on showing grace. And a, a just man can fall seven times and rise up again. And my friends, here's the last statement, and don't miss this this morning. It is not if you fail or when you fail, but how you respond. I read in the book of Peter, Peter who denied Jesus Christ, Peter who fled from Jesus Christ, Peter who fell asleep. I read about this Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius who are kept by the power of God. Peter says, listen, I was a failure, but I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, and everyone can be held, everyone can be strengthened by the power of God. I imagine that Peter felt there was no hope in life, but Jesus Christ in his grace and his strength and his wisdom came back and said, Peter, you can still serve me. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. And Peter, he led a ministry for Jesus Christ, not because he was great, but because God's grace is great. You see, it's not if you fail or when you fail, but how you respond. I read about in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, where the apostle Paul, before an Acts, he said, listen, don't, take, uh, don't bring Mark. And the, the Bible says the contention was so strong that Barnabas and that Paul separated such disagreement. In fact, you find that Mark was probably Barnabas' cousin, yet in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says this, listen, bring Mark because he is profitable to me for the ministry. You see, something happened in the, in the life of Mark. He became profitable. And I'll tell you what, I was gonna, if you have your Bibles, look back in Mark. And I want to show you something here in Mark. Look in Mark. I could point out one verse, but I don't have to. We have 16 chapters. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 3, Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 7, Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 11, Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 13, Mark chapter 14, Mark chapter 15, and Mark chapter 16, all written through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by a man who fled and left his clothes by a man who quit on the Apostle Paul. And 16 chapters later, sometime after that time, Mark came back to Jesus Christ. Mark said, you know what? I'll take one step back, and by the grace of God, I am what I am. And God allowed Mark to have a place in the testimony of Scripture. This man who was a failure, who failed and failed big and failed again and again, God says, I'm not done with him yet. He comes back to me, a just man falls seven times, yet rises up again, and now forever. Because the Bible says forever, thy word is settled in heaven, forever, we have an account from a failure. But we don't remember the failure, we remember the grace of God in his life. And in fact, and in fact, what's amazing about the Gospel of Mark is that the Gospel of Mark is the first gospel that was written. It was written before Matthew. It was written before Luke. It was written before John. And so this failure, this young man who fled, this young man who quit, this young man who wasn't profitable and became profitable, became the first writer to recount what Jesus Christ did. So don't talk to me about failure. Don't talk to me about mistakes. Because I'm going to talk to you about Jesus Christ. I'm going to talk to you about the gospel of Mark, and I can read about a man who didn't do right, yet he came back to God, he took that first step, and God used him. It was a while ago in Detroit. There was a museum that put on display two paintings by an artist known as Rembrandt. They put these two paintings on display but an art critic came by 
And he told the museum, he said, I think one of these, fa- these paintings is a fake. The museum was apparently nervous about this. And so they brought in some experts to examine the paintings. And the experts said, this art critic was absolutely correct. That one of these paintings is a fake. Rembrandt didn't paint this painting. They asked the expert, how do you know of these two paintings, which one was a Rembrandt, which one was genuine, which one was a masterpiece, and which one was a fraud? And the art critic, the art critic said something powerful. He said, as I studied Rembrandt, Rembrandt always had mistakes in his paintings. He said, every true Rembrandt you look at, there's going to be mistakes. There's errors. He said, but Rembrandt would cover them up in a way to make them part of his masterpiece. Rembrandt would use that inerrant brush mark, that color that wasn't quite right, and he would use it and use it as part of the glowing masterpiece that we admire and respect. He said, this painting here is a fraud because it's too perfect. He said, there's no mistakes in it. My friends, I can't but help but think what Jesus Christ does in our life. I love the fact that in Mark chapter 14, we find, about, we find out about the mistakes that Mark himself made. He wasn't glorifying the mistake. He wasn't saying, well, that was a good thing that happened. My friends, he was acknowledging that sometimes we're going to fail. Sometimes we're going to fail big. And sometimes, my friends, we're going to keep on failing. But with the power of Jesus Christ, his grace, his love, your failure, my failure, doesn't have to be final. Maybe today you have failure in your history. Maybe you have failure in your reality. Today, you can take that one step back toward Jesus Christ. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, verse 9. And my friends, that verse is not written to those who don't know Jesus. It's written to those who know and claim the name of Jesus Christ. And today, take the one step back. But Jesus Christ can still use those broken pieces and make something beautiful. Thank you.